I'm Audrey Bilger. I'm a professor of literature here, and I'm the faculty director of the Center for Writing and Public Discourse. It's good to see you all here. You've heard of Jane Austen, an English writer who lived at the end of the 18th century and early 19th century, a major literary figure, author of six classic novels. These days, Jane Austen is something of an icon. She's a celebrity figure. We might even say, Jane Austen is everywhere. Soon, she's going to be on the 10-pound note in England, um, actually replacing Charles Darwin. I like to think of this as survival of the wittiest. <laughs> she's on film screens, buttons, bumper stickers, T-shirts. You see Jane Austen all over places like Etsy, for instance. Everybody wants to personalize their own Jane Austen products. And it can get, frankly, a little overwhelming because Jane Austen fans love to love Jane Austen, and they love to talk about how much they love Jane Austen. And I think for those of you who may have read Jane Austen when you were, say, 15 or maybe once in college, um, and you didn't like Jane Austen, you might develop your sense of Austen from this kind of superficial way of seeing her, something that, that cast Jane Austen as trivial and as doing fluffy novels about things that aren't really that important for human life. The truth is, however, that Jane Austen has endured almost 200 years after her death because she deals with fundamental human relationships, some of the things that matter most in our lives. Things like family dynamics, the complications of those, embarrassing relatives, arrogant bullies, Social politics, who goes where, when? Parties, who doesn't like parties? Courtship. And let's not forget how to survive the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Blake Horridge knows what I'm talking about. Jane Austen was ahead of her time. So take the Jane Austen so seminar if you want to survive the, Jane the uh, zombie apocalypse. Seriously though, two very fundamental decisions that we all make in our lives are choosing our friends and deciding on a partner for life and how to have a happy marriage. And reading Jane Austen can help you with these kinds of decisions because the characters in her novels have to rec re you know, wrestle with this the same way that we ordinary mortals do. In the Jane Austen world, a word that can help orient you and help you figure out who to choose as friends and partners is credit. Now this is a word that's very familiar to um, econ accounting majors, for instance, and um, CMC grads in general, when you think about finances, right? Credit, we know that. And in Austen's world too, people are often judging one another based on how much money they have right, or what their, what their prospects are. And I would say that Jane Austen says that's the bad way to go. You really need to think of credit in terms of character, right? You have to think of someone's reputation, their honor, their integrity. People who say what they mean, do what they say, these are the people that you want to surround yourself with. These are the people you want for your friends and you want to have as your partners. Now, you don't get to choose your family. And in Austin, very often, it, family members will not do credit to their offspring. And our protagonists have to sort of make their way through life, um, making up sometimes for the, the um, errors of their family structure. The thing about trusting people in Austin is that you can't trust everything you hear. You have to be able to figure things out. And that issue that Remy was just talking about, about first impressions, is one that is really important. You have to go beneath the surface. You have to be able to judge. You have to be able to weigh evidence in order to know who to trust. Unfortunately, in most Austin novels, you see a lot of false friends, lots more false friends than true friends. In her very first novel, the protagonist, Catherine Moreland, in Northanger Abbey, shown here on the, the right, travels to Bath, leaving home for the first time, and she makes friends right away with this woman, Isabella Thorpe. They become BFFs, they can't separate from one another. What Catherine doesn't know, though, is that Isabella already knows something about Catherine. Isabella's interested in possibly marrying Catherine's brother. Now, the story gets complicated because of 
what Catherine doesn't know about this person who's pretending to be her friend. There's manipulation, there are, there are bad things that happen, and it almost gets in the way of, of Catherine's happy ending. In Austen's next novel, Sense and Sensibility, she also takes up this idea of false friends in the persona of a woman named Lucy Steele, who makes friends with one of the protagonists, Eleanor Dashwood. Now in this novel, Eleanor sees right through Lucy, and so does the reader, and recognizes that Lucy is a manipul manipulative figure. And so she's not fooled by Lucy, although as a false friend, Lucy can still do some damage. There are lots of examples like this in Austen. Her very last novel focuses on another problem, which is how do you, tr how do you trust even your closest friends when they advise you against your own best interest. And this novel actually begins with a backstory, which is that a close friend of the family, Lady Russell, has advised the heroine not to marry the man that she loves, whose name happens to be Wentworth. So he's somebody who deserves credit. Lady Russell doesn't give him credit. And the novel begins with Anne Elliot living in regret and wishing that she had done something else, that she had weighed the evidence differently, that she had seen Wentworth's credit for what it was. She almost doesn't get her happy ending as a result of this bad advice that she takes. And so the stakes are high in Jane Austen's novels, and friends are hard to come by. Each of the novels, nonetheless, ends with a happy resolution, and those happy resolutions are, not to spoil anything, but typically marriages. So that your very best friend in an Austen novel might ultimately be your spouse. And if you don't marry well, um, then you might be in for a lot of misery. So this is really an important decision. So let's take as our example for choosing your partner for life, Pride and Prejudice, which was initially called First Impressions. Pride and Prejudice, by the way, is celebrating its bicentennial this year, so it's fitting that we look at Elizabeth Bennet and Fitzwilliam Darcy, two of the most famous romantic protagonists of all time. Now, when they first meet, it's not love at first sight. In fact, Mr. Darcy is so busy looking down his nose at everybody else that he can't even see Elizabeth, let alone try to give her credit. Even after they're properly introduced and they start to have some interactions, they don't really get each other. And this is because Elizabeth has heard this rumor about Mr. Darcy that she believes. So she can't really evaluate his character because she's trusting somebody else's word rather than really listening to what's in front of her. Now, those of you who know the novel, and even those of you who don't, know that Mr. Darcy will ask Elizabeth to marry him. He does this actually not once, but twice in the novel. And the first time, she says no. Now, she says no because he doesn't ask in a very nice way. And, you know, he feels like he can say to her that her family is an embarrassment to him and that marrying her would be a step down and that he loves her against his will. Note, that is not the best way to propose. <laughs> She says no, though, and he gets justifiably angry. He's just mad. If the novel ended there, it would be a tragedy and not a bright and sparkling comedy. What Darcy does next is really important. He goes back to where he's staying, and he writes, and he writes, and he writes, and he writes, all the things that he wants Elizabeth to know so that she can justly weigh his character and give him the credit that he deserves. She gets this letter. She reads it not once, but more than once, and she sees who he is. And as the novel progresses, um, she begins to feel closer to him as a result of that reading and as a result of other things that happen, so that when he asks her again, she says, yes. After they've gotten engaged, they talk about that letter again, and Darcy wants to know the letter. Did it make you think better of me? Did you, on reading it, give any credit to its contents. And what he wants to know is, did this change your mind about me? Did this allow you to see me for who I am? Now, by this point, he's also um, treated her relatives very well when they visit Pemberley, his estate. He's saved her sister from ruin. So he's built other forms of credit with her. He wants to go back, though, to that letter because he wants to know, did he clear the deck? Were they able to start there and, and begin to build credit with one another? Important to think about with Darcy and Elizabeth is that they each make one another a better person. 
Elizabeth learns from Darcy to look beneath the surface and not to go by first impressions. Darcy learns from Elizabeth to laugh at himself and not take himself so seriously, so not to be up on that high horse. And these are important lessons for all of the marriages within Jane Austen. So when you're choosing your partner for life, a fundamental thing to look for is equality. You can't trust someone you don't see as your equal. A thing for people to do as you're taking advice from Jane Austen in, in choosing your partner for life is to sort of mind your own interpersonal credit rating. Are you as good as your word? Do you respect people? Do people respect you? I learned everything that I need to know about equality in marriage and marriage equality from Jane Austen and my wife. And I would urge you to give Jane Austen credit and to read those six novels, thinking about how you can learn to be a better person by going beneath the surface, by not accepting first impressions. Jane Austen will make you a better person. It's really up to you. Thank you. <laughs>